what I'm sharing is our today's lesson on a, on a blank page. We are going to do the concept of what we call market equilibrium. And this is a, a subtopic that is going to bring in uh, two different uh, topics, which you have already covered. One is a, a demand analysis, and the other one is a supply analysis. So it's going to combine these two in relation to the establishment of the equilibrium for the commodity uh, in the market. So what is market equilibrium by definition? I would say that equilibrium would mean a state of balance or a state of rest into which now applying that concept to uh, the market for a commodity, it would actually mean a state in which that market for that commodity is at a list or at a balance in which there is no disturbance. We say demand and supply forces are actually equal. And therefore, at that position, both the consumer and the supply of the commodity are satisfied with the price prevailing as well as the quantity uh, offered and of course demanded uh, in the market at that particular uh, time. Because we normally say price keeps on changing with a change in terms of uh, uh, time where time being an independent variable, it does influence so many other things to actually uh, experience a change in the market. So this concept of equilibrium can actually be illustrated on a graph. We have dealt with the uh, price as a major factor affecting both demand and supply of a commodity in the market. And we went ahead and demonstrated how to come up with a normal a demand curve, avoiding uh, such exceptional cases, whichever we talked about. And of course, the supply curve, again, uh, minus the cases that do violate the law of what? Of supply. So on a graphical representation, would assume a normal case in the market for a commodity. where we are going to represent demand and supply curves pretend on the same uh, graph. So still price on the Y to be pretend against the quantity presented on the X axis. And normal circumstances under normal circumstances, when I say normal circumstances, we are avoiding those exceptional cases. A demand curve, assuming normal case in the market, we say it, it does slope from left to right downwards. A normal supply curve would slow from left to right upwards. Okay, at the point of intersection, and these are not necessarily straight lines, it depends on the, uh, on the change happening on supply or even demand with a change in the price of the commodity. At the point of intersection, we label what we call the equilibrium point or position and the price prevailing in the market for the commodity at that time, we call it the equilibrium price. In short, the P equilibrium price. The quantity demanded and supplied, which is actually the same, is called the equilibrium quantity. In short, the QE. 
I repeat, under normal circumstances, Sorry for that. The normal circumstances, the demand curve would slope downwards, the supply curve would slope upwards. At the point of intersection between these two curves represented on the same graph, we have the equilibrium point also known as the equilibrium position. The prevailing market price for the commodity we call it the equilibrium price and the quantity demanded and supplied, we call it the equilibrium quantity. We can abbreviate that one as the QE. This is a situation where we are saying the market is in equilibrium, where demand and supply are equal. The condition for equilibrium At equilibrium point, as to evaluate the equilibrium point of a commodity, what is the condition? The condition for equilibrium is that demand for the commodity must always equate to supply. And therefore one should be able now to come up with the equilibrium price as well as the equilibrium quantity. And at this point we say both the economic forces, the demand and uh, supply economic forces, when we talk of economic forces, we are talking of the excess demand and excess supply we say at this point of equilibrium, they are actually at least, they are the same. No forces more than the other in the market for are the commodity. If the commodity is not in equilibrium in the market, we'll talk about the disequilibrium and we'll see why a disequilibrium would be experienced in the market for a commodity. So, Assuming we have some data provided here. We've got some table here with the price per unit, they should say in shillings. We have the quantity demanded. And here we have the quantity supplied. And we want to come up with the equilibrium for the commodity in the market. So at a price of shillings 10 per unit, let's say the quantity demanded here is around 50 units. A price of say 18 shillings. Of course, we'd expect a decline in the quantity. Let's assume 44 units. A price of say shillings 20. The quantity demanded here could be around 35 units. And as I assume at a price of shillings 24, the quantity demanded here could be about 30 units. Then as the price increases, we'd expect an increase in the quantity supplied. Let's say we have an amount of 25 units supplied at a price of shillings 10 per unit. 
when the price increases to shillings 18, let us assume we are supplying around 38 units, the price of shillings 20, 45 units are supplied, and maybe at a price of shillings 24 per unit, we have to say 55 units supplied in the market for the commodity. This is the data provided and you are asked to come up with the equilibrium for this commodity uh, in the market. How do you go about that? On a Cartesian plane, you choose some space where you're going to represent both the demand and the supply curve. Remember on the same graph, quantity still protend on the X, price should be protend on the Y. You can see my graphical representation. Rebo your axis, and of course here you're going to have a small title, a graph representing the market equilibrium. If this was a commodity quote and say X or any other, again, you give the title accommodating the uh, name of that commodity. The smallest price that I see in my data is shillings 10, a range of uh, 10, 10 would do, or you can provide a small allowance, for example, and then you can start at around 10. Maybe you go for a range of 5, 5, because of 18 there, 15, maybe 20, and 25. Ten, maybe fifteen there. Around twenty. Since the highest is twenty-four, we can go up to twenty-five. That would be enough. You try and spread your work to cover about uh, twenty-five. Three quarters of your space. On the quantity, the smallest amount, both the demand and supply, the lowest quantity is at uh, 25 units. Again, you can allow for a small difference before you choose on your scale. You can start at around 20 or even 25, it's okay. I'll start at 20, maybe 25, 30, Thirty-five. The highest is fifty-five. Which you can have it as we mark the end of our scale there, accommodating all the quantities that we have in our data. So we can start by plotting the quantity demanded against the price. You can do one at a time, don't mix. A price of shillings 10, we have an amount of 50 units, some are there. Price of shillings 18, slightly higher than 15. We have 44 units, slightly less than 45. Uh, some are here. A price of shillings 20, we have an amount of 35 units. Some are here. Come and plot that. And lastly, at a price of shillings 24, we have 30 units. Again, you come and do your plotting there. Of course, this is not a straight line. 
Eugenia protein points using free hard. Try and smoothen the cup. Join your protein points. And then, of course, to correct a demand curve, we need to have some DDs at the extreme ends. As you can see, this is a normal case conforming to the law of demand. Our curve is sloping downwards. Then we represent the supply curve at a price of shillings 10. We have 25 units. Some are here. At the price of shillings 18, we have 38 units. Some are here. You come and represent that. 38 units, some are here. At the price of shillings 20, we have 45 units. And then at a price of shillings 24, we have 55 units. Somewhere here, you come into your protein. Then of course, again, this is not a straight line. If it's a straight line, you use uh, a ruler to join your points. If not, you smoothen the cup using free hard. So there it goes, we have the supply cup sloping downwards from right to left or you can say sloping upwards from left to right at the point of intersection you rebo your equilibrium point at the point of intersection you have the equilibrium point the one I've marked with the pink color you can see that then you use a ruler to drop a perpendicular line to touch the x-axis. To touch the x-axis, it's slightly less than 40, slightly less than 40, an approximate a, a price of shillings. How much? Let's see on the y-axis. This is slightly less than 20 around shillings 19 because this was around 18 that we were plotting which is slightly higher than this one now an approximate a price of shillings 19 there with an amount of around 39 units since you're doing graphical representation estimates are around in that case we may not get all of us the same result it will depend on your accuracy again as you can see I've deviated a little bit when I was trying to estimate the price as well as the quantity. Use a ruler to join uh, to the X and also to the Y axis so that you'll be able to come up with a, a better estimate or a more accurate estimate. So this is the one way into which we can represent the equilibrium of a commodity in the market when some uh, quantities say on the demand and the supply are related to the price that is by graphical representation at the point of equilibrium where we have the condition for uh, demand and supply being the same you identify both the equilibrium price and also the equilibrium uh, quantity so if given a problem and you're asked about the equilibrium uh, for a commodity make sure you identify the equilibrium price and also the equilibrium quantity. In some instances, we talked about, if you remember, the linear functions taking care of both the demand and also supply. So if our commodity has both the linear demand and supply functions given, is it possible to come up with a uh, the demand curve, or rather the demand curve and supply curve to identify the equilibrium point. So the equilibrium price and the quantity for the commodity. 
all can we have some calculations say to identify the equilibrium price and also the equilibrium quantity that is possible given the linear demand and also a supply of functions so to represent that will be guided by an illustration or an example Let's see from linear functions how we can identify the equilibrium price and the quantity for the commodity in the market. So again, I'm sh uh, sharing on my screen So let's see a commodity say x its demand and supply functions are given as follows Okay, so I'll start with the quantity given by the function 20, say minus P, and I'll also have another linear function. <coughs> Again, I'll call it quantity as a function of price given by this equation, minus 15 plus 3p. So I want us to start from an angle where <clears throat> we are the ones to identify which one defines a demand and which one defines a supply. In our last class, we said what? Whenever I'm given a function of the quantity related to the price, if it's to be called demand function, then I should see a negative relationship between these two variables, quantity and price are negatively related. This is what I can now call the quantity demanded as a function of the price, okay? If we have a, a relationship between these two variables, the quantity and the price, and that they are showing a positive relationship. You can see this sign here being positive. It shows a positive relationship between the quantity and the price. Therefore, we can define this one to be a supply function. I repeat, demand and price are supposed to be negative related supply and price are supposed to be positively related. So if given these two functions and you are asked to identify which one represents what, for the demand, a negative relationship should be portrayed between the two variables, quantity and the price. For the supply, there should be a positive relationship between the quantity and the price. Now, how do we identify the uh, demand uh, 
a function and supply function on a graph. We did this in our last class. You can come up with a small table where price will be written to the quantity. We have even done this one as part of the assignment. You can set a price of shillings 10, how much will be the quantity? Of course, this will be 10. At a price of say shillings five, the quantity would go up to 15 units. And then you can come in, plot this to uh, constitute a straight line. Also, for the quantity supplied, you can rate it to the price. You can set a price of shillings 10. How much would be the quantity? If you put 10 shillings here, you would have 15 units. Assuming the price is at shillings 5, it's good to go for the same prices since you're drawing this on the same partition plane. If you put shillings 5 here, you'd have a quantity of how much? Zero units. This would be 15 minus 15, zero. And then on a graphical representation, you want to plot these two together. Quantity on the X, remember, with the price to be plotted on the Y. Upholding to the rules for graphical representation, remember. So you can just stick to the two prices you have used in your analysis of the quantities. The price of shillings five and 10, you don't need a scale there. Then the quantities, of course, again, we are dealing with about uh, three units here, zero unit, 10 units and 15. So again, I can go for a range of uh, five, five maybe five there, 10, maybe 15, that is enough. You can even spread it to accommodate a lot of space there on to your, to your right. So at a price of shillings, 10, we have 10 units here. When you substitute 10, uh, 10 for P in our first equation here, some are there. The price of shillings five, we have 15 units. You can extend, two points are enough to draw a straight line. Remember this is a linear function. You're using a ruler to join your points. Mine may not be exact straight line, but you can see it's not so far away from a straight line. You can extend it to either side even to cut your x-axis it's still okay even to cut the y-axis it's still okay this is our demand curve the dd then at a price of shillings five we have zero units some are here then at a price of shillings 10 we have about uh, 15 units 15 units is some are here you come and plot that. You can include other prices if you want. And then you're joining, your supply curve is supposed to uh, go through the origin, the zero, zero mm -hmm. coordinate. Of course, again, you're using a, a ruler to join your points. So you have your supply curve represented there. Then at the point of intersection, you come and identify the equilibrium point. You approximate what price is going to give rise to what quantity. You can talk of a price of around shillings. This approximation could be around shillings, eight or eight shillings and 50 cents, some are there. 
around 8.5 or 9, depending on your accuracy. This is slightly higher than 11, maybe 11.5 or 12. Remember, as we said, this is a graphical representation. We are likely to have a small change in between the quantity and the uh, price when we do our estimations. If we were to go through the calculation way, method two, that is method one, when you represent your two linear functions on the same graph, and at the point of intersection, you are identifying the equilibrium point to give rise to both the equilibrium price. This is a P and the equilibrium quantity here. In short, the QE units. It's not a mass that one does the graphical representation. You can as well calculate the equilibrium price and the quantity from the two linear functions given. The first step is the condition for equilibrium. The condition for equilibrium is what? At equilibrium point, At equilibrium point, the condition is that demand for the commodity should actually equate to the supply. Okay. So you take your demand function. The demand function is the QD function. You equate this one to the supply function, the QS. And then of course you bring the right equations for the two functions. 20 minus P is our quantity demanded. We equate it to the quantity supplied as a function of price minus 15 plus 3p. Okay. You group the right terms together. Of course, you bring the price to one of the uh, directions. Could it be the right or the left? Either way, it will still work. So we'll have 15 going to this other side. We'll have 35. We create this one to the price, taking it to the other side, you'll have 4P for that price. Then as you can see, we are solving for the P, making it the subject. We'll have 35 divided by four. That if five divided by four, that should give us a price of what, let's see. If somebody has found that, you can uh, indicate it on the chat. That is 8.75 as our equilibrium price. Shillings. So you can see this is not too far away from our estimation. We estimated a price of shillings eight and fifty cents, slightly uh, less than what we are calculating, but we are within the estimation is okay for us. If a student had estimated a price of shillings nine, it's still okay. We are within uh, the range of uh, allowance provided for that. 
then the question is, now that you have found the equilibrium price, how then do we determine the equilibrium quantity? Class, attention on this. Once you have found one of the uh, variables, the price, for example, in our case, you will substitute the figure found in either, and I repeat, in either the demand function or the supply function to be able now to come up with the equilibrium quantity. I repeat, substitute the figure found in either the demand or supply function so that you now be able to identify the other variable. In our case, we are looking for the equilibrium quantity. And you should be able to get the same result, whether you use the demand or the supply function. So for me to come up with the quantity demanded, which is the same as the quantity supplied, that is our QE now here, we can apply both the demand or supply. Let's use the demand first and we see what will be the result. We'll take 20, we minus P, stick to the function given. But now for us to come up with the QE, we should be substituting the PE in our function. 20 minus PE. Why did I substitute the P when I'm constituting the QE? Look at our graphical representation here. When price is at equilibrium point, we have the quantity known as the QE. They should go hand in hand. So to come up with our quantity here, we'll take the price so computed, which was coming to eight shillings and 75 cents. We just subtract that. And this will give us an amount of, let's see, eleven units point two five. And as you can see again from our estimate, we are within the range. We got eleven point five there, which is slightly less than uh, twelve. And our calculated figure is 11.25. So we are okay with that. How else can we find the quantity, whichever we are calling the equilibrium quantity? We can apply the supply function. Of course, you'll use one. There's no need for you to apply the two, but what if somebody had applied the uh, supply function, which was given us minus 15 plus 3p. Again, for you to find the QE, the price prevailing in the market for this commodity should be at equilibrium point, minus 15 plus 3pe. You substitute the equilibrium price on your function, the quantity supplied function, okay? So we'll take negative 15, you add three. The cost here you're bringing the P, the price we had found of shillings eight and 75 cents. That should give us what? Again, we have the same amount of 11 units, 0.25. And these two should actually be exactly the same. You find that there is a variation or there's a difference, then 
something is not okay with your workings. And of course, we are saying you can just stick to one, but remember to maintain accuracy. So that if somebody had applied the other function, the expectation is that you should have the same result at the end of the day. So we have learned that to come up with the equilibrium of a commodity in the market, there are two uh, dimensions into which we can look at this. One is where uh, from a SEJU, we are provided with a relationship existing between the price and the quantity, both on the demand and the supply. And by graphical representation, you should be able to read through the point of intersection where you estimate the equilibrium price and the equilibrium quantity. Again, if the demand and supply functions are taking the linear form, one can be able to still plot the two functions on a graph and remember the same graph. And at the point of intersection, you still be able to identify the equilibrium price and the equilibrium quantity. Then through the calculation, the condition for equilibrium is that demand must equate to supply. So bring the two equations, you rate them, whereby you'll be able to identify one of the variables and you substitute the figure so found in either the demand or supply functions to come up with the other a variable. For us, we started by looking at the P, the equilibrium price, which has helped us now to identify the equilibrium quantity by using either the demand or the supply function. So I hope that is clear on how to come up with the demand uh, at equilibrium, also the supply at equilibrium, and also the equilibrium price in short to identify the market equilibrium for a commodity and under normal circumstances where we are saying to identify the equilibrium for a commodity in the market, we have got no economic forces existing in the market. So with that, let's now look at the disequilibrium in the market for a commodity. Okay, what is market disequilibrium? First of all, I take you back a little bit to the definition of the market equilibrium. We have said this is a state of rest or a state of balance in which the demand and supply for a commodity are equal and therefore there exist no economic forces to offset the situation in the market for a commodity. That the two uh, forces are actually uh, the same, no uh, force that is more than the other. We normally say they are as the state of balance. Not all the times in the market for a commodity that demand would equate to supply. Many are the instances when those two are not the same. And of course, this is the most occurring situation in the market for a particular commodity. What do we mean by that? The market, uh, the market disequilibrium would be as a result of what we call the economic forces. Hmm? This occurs due to the presence of economic forces. What are these economic forces we are talking of? We have got two economic forces that may exist in the market for a commodity. One is what we call the excess demand and also the excess supply. I repeat, economic forces may be 
either, of course they have to be one at a time, either excess demand or excess supply. Excess demand or excess supply. And let's deal with each one at a time. We understand what is the meaning of these two forces. Okay, now start by looking at the excess demand. What is excess demand? Excess demand occurs when demand is more than the supply of the commodity in the market. This is an economic force which occurs when demand for the commodity in the market exceeds the supply. The question is, if demand or what is being demanded by the consumers is more than what the suppliers have provided in the market, for a given commodity, our problem is what will happen to the market for that commodity? Okay, what is excess supply on the other hand as an economic force? Excess supply would occur as an economic force when is a situation when the supply of the commodity in the market is actually more than the demand. Are there situations where supplier has brought in more quantity than what is being demanded by the, the users of the product? There could be such a situation. The question is again, or our problem is to identify if supply is exceeding demand, what would be the implication of that? To illustrate the result of these two forces, if either of them were to exist in the market, I'll consider a graphical representation here. We have the quantity and we have the price. On a graphical representation, again, we represent both the demand curve and the supply curve. Demand sloping downwards, supply curve sloping upwards. At the point of intersection, we have the equilibrium point. giving rise to both equilibrium quantity and the equilibrium price. Of course, you make it more uh, straight, not like mine. Assuming, assuming, the market that has been set by the, uh, the market forces, the, the price set by the market forces, sorry. Let's call it price P1 here, could be shillings five, a unit or whichever the price. Let's see the implication of this price. From the law of supply we know, the lower the price, the lower the quantity supplied in the market. Let us assume we are now offering quantity Q1 units in the market for sale. But on the other hand, look at this class. The price prevailing in the market is attracting so many uh, consumers. 
the demand is high for that commodity in the market reason the price is much more affordable by most people to this consumer he could be willing now to purchase all the way to q4 units of the commodity in the market as you can see now there exists a difference in between there's a difference between the quantity demanded and of course the quantity supplied in the market for this commodity this difference is what we call look at this the amount demanded at q1 uh, at q4 sorry the amount supplied at q1 units the demand is overwhelming whatever has been supplied in the market this is what i can call the excess demand up here with me in my illustration plus the excess demand whatever has been demanded at that price of shillings p1 is actually uh, more than what we have supplied in the market so we talk of an economic force known as excess demand q4 units demanded are more than the q1 units supplied what are the implications of an excess demand in the market for a commodity? With excess demand, of course, you'd expect this price P1 will start to increase. That's the normal behavior in the market for a commodity, that when we are demanding more than what has been supplied, the supplier will take a, an opportunity now of increasing the price of the commodity in the market. Look at the rush hours, for example, when every other person wants to go back home. Demand is higher than the supply of the vehicles available in the market, which means demand will be pushing the price level upwards. So by definition class, we can say this. An excess demand is an economic force which exerts, which exerts an upward pressure on the price of the commodity in the market under normal circumstances, which exerts an upward pressure in the price or on the price, sorry, on the price of the commodity uh, in the market, but again, under normal circumstances. I'm quoting normal circumstances because we'll see again a case where we may be having the government's intervention. So with excess demand, price starts now to go up. Let's see the behavior by both the consumer and the supplier of the commodity uh, during the time price starts to increase. Of course, uh, with an increase in the price level, P1 being pushed towards the P, the price will make the supplier now to start increasing on the supply. You see, as the price increases, you'd expect the supplier to start increasing on the quantity. But on the other hand, the commodity is becoming, could be expensive to the consumer, but I say expensive in quotes because this is relative. The consumer now starts to decline on the quantity demanded. You see, with an increase in price, if you have to go by this graph, the, uh, the curve for the DD shows that the quantity will now starts to go down. This may happen to a point where the two may actually become the same and again we restore back the equilibrium position. If that happens, we can call such a situation a stable equilibrium in the market for the commodity. I repeat, with an excess demand as an economic force, the price will start to increase all the excess demand will exert a pressure on the price level. With an increase in the price of the commodity, the quantity supplied will now start to go down, to, to, to increase. You can see there'll be an experience of an increase in the supply uh, in the market for the commodity. But on the other hand, the consumer will now start experiencing high price, so he'll decline on the quantity demanded. The two may happen that they are now the same, increase in supply, decline in the quantity demanded, okay? The equilibrium, the equilibrium for this commodity may be restored back. 
and such, we can talk about a stable equilibrium, okay? Let's look at what we mean by the excess supply. I will assume in the market for our commodity here, the price prevailing is price P2. I've used a different color so that it is much more uh, feasible. Price P2, let's see the implication of it in the market. The quantity demanded for this commodity could be at around Q2 units. say 20 units or whichever the amount. On the other hand, the supply is being attracted by a, an increase in the price. You can see it's higher now to offer a larger quantity in the market for sale. I will assume all the way to Q3 units. If the prevailing market price are set by the market forces is price P2, the consumer will demand a lower quantity, let's assume quantity Q2 units. On the other hand, being a higher price, it will attract more supply of the commodity, say all the way to Q3 units. There exists a difference, as you can see, between uh, the price and the quantity, uh, between the demand, sorry, and the supply. And this difference is what we can call the excess the excess supply. The difference between demand and supply, supply being more than demand, we can call this one the excess supply. Now that there is an excess supply, what will happen in the market for this commodity? Excess supply by definition occurs when uh, a larger quantity has been offered in the market for a commodity than what is being demanded in the market. Meaning, as an economic force, since we want to do away with excess supply or with excess stocks, the supplier would be willing to lower the price level of this commodity. Of course, you don't want to have everything, if it's, say, a perishable commodity going bad, that you have losses in card, you'd rather sell it at a throwaway price. So price will start coming down. So as an excess supply, we say it is an economic force which exerts a down on pressure, a down on pressure, on the price of the commodity uh, in the market. Meaning, price will now start to uh, go down. And let's see the implication of a decline in the price level of this commodity. If that starts to come down, the quantity demanded, as you can see, will now start to increase. On the other hand, as a supplier, you are fearing of losses with a lower uh, price so you'll start declining on the quantity as supplied in the market. These two again, with an increase in demand, with a decline in the supply, may meet at some point where they'll be the same. And so we can say the condition for equilibrium would be established when demand and supply are the same, meaning they will actually have restored back the equilibrium position again an example of what we call a, a stable equilibrium. A stable equilibrium is a situation where in the market for a commodity class, the economic forces, either an excess demand or an excess supply, whenever they exist in the market for the commodity, there will be a restoration of the equilibrium back to its original position. I repeat, a uh, stable equilibrium occurs when, with the presence of an economic force, could be an excess supply or an excess demand, the equilibrium position may be restored back to its original position. So that is what we call uh, this equilibrium in the market for a commodity. And I've stated this class, a uh, disequilibrium occurs when, Demand, the condition for disequilibrium is that demand 
for the commodity in the market does not does not equate to supply they are not the same okay and if they are not the same it means either demand is more than supply an economic force known as excess demand which if it happens it exerts an upward pressure on the price level of the commodity in the market okay an excess supply will occur as an economic force when the supply is more than demand and if that is the case it would mean that the excess supply will force the price level downwards it is an economic force which exerts a down on pressure on the price of the commodity if assuming any one of these two forces exist in the market for the commodity excess supply or even excess demand and that prices are being pushed towards the equilibrium price to a point where the equilibrium point is being restored back to its original position that is what we call a stable equilibrium of course uh, an unstable equilibrium would occur if the prices were being pulled far away from the equilibrium or at price and so would not be able to restore back the equilibrium position to where it was for such an unstable equilibrium if you remember we covered some exceptional cases to the law of demand and also to the law of supply if we have the equilibrium here between the price and the the quantity we have protein say the demand function and the supply function Assuming here we have the the exceptional cases to the law of demand and to the law of supply. If you remember, we talked about a backward bending supply curve of labor, for example, as an abnormal supply curve. Okay. We also talked about a progressive demand curve, still an abnormal demand curve. We talked about exceptional cases such as the ostentatious goods, the given goods, and so on. If our equilibrium point is somewhere here between demand and supply, of course, this would be our equilibrium quantity, the equilibrium price here. I'm demonstrating a, an unstable equilibrium. This being the price PE. Say we have a price prevailing in the market here at a price of shillings P2 or some 20 shillings say so. Then here we have a price prevailing in the market assuming price P1 or shillings 10. The implication of price P1 is what? This would be our excess what class? This being supply, this being demand, this would actually talk about excess supply. There'll be an excess supply here. Let me call it ES. And we have said under normal circumstances, okay, an excess supply whenever it exists in the market, it pushes the price level downward. So you can see now, we are kind of pulling the price P1 far, far away from the equilibrium price. The price P1 will start declining, which means it will not go near to the price PE, and there is no way to which this equilibrium can be restored back. The same, assuming the prevailing market price here is price P2, the implication of this in the market for our commodity is that there is an excess demand you can see the quantity demanded will be more here than the quantity supplied here. So to talk about the excess demand, let me call it ED. Excess demand, we have said, is an economic force, which does what? 
it's actually exerts an upward pressure on the price. So price will be pulled far, far away from the equilibrium price PE here. As it increases, the PE as it increases, it will be pulled far, far away from the PE. And there's no way to which we are able to restore back our equilibrium position to where it was. So by definition, how would one define an unstable equilibrium? An unstable equilibrium occurs in the market when with the presence of economic forces, either an excess demand or an excess supply, the prevailing market prices are pulled far, far away from the equilibrium price and the equilibrium point is not restored back to its original position. That is how we may define an unstable equilibrium different from what we have called a stable equilibrium. Hope that is clear. In some instances, we do have what we call government intervention. Of course, we are talking of price controls. Uh, in regards to setting prices of some commodities, some, I'm not talking of all, certain commodities in the market for a commodity. So I'm going to introduce slightly the concept of uh, price controls. This is a government intervention because not always that the price of a commodity will be uh, set and controlled by the market forces. Market forces are the excess demand and the excess supply that you have talked about in the determination of the prevailing market price for a particular commodity uh, in the market. So again, I've shared another uh, concept here called the price controlled. And would first of all want to understand what exactly do we mean by this term. Of course, this is a situation where we are not letting the forces of the uh, demand and supply take control in the market for a given commodity. And therefore, we define a price controls as an artificial uh, situation where the government would intervene and set the price, of course, control it uh, for a particular commodity in the market, but guided by the, the rules and the regulations set uh, in the country. So price control would say it's the government's uh, intervention into setting the price of a commodity in the market through uh, the registrations already uh, defined in the country. And of course, mm. it's not for all the commodities where the price will be regulated by the government. There are circumstances under which the government may consider to set the price of a commodity uh, in the market. So we are seeing a situation where we have moved far away from uh, rating the price being a fully, uh, freely sorry, determined by the market forces and there's some intervention where there could be a reason behind our price controls. We have got two types of price controls. Number one is what we call a maximum price control. Also known as a price ceiling. And this is that price, the highest to which a commodity would experience in the market. Uh, usually set by the government and this maximum price, if you are a supply of a commodity uh, whose price is being set by the government as a maximum price, the product 
cannot be sold beyond this particular price. Usually set by the government, when the government feels that, the price that we were talking of as determined by the market forces, the PE is actually very high. If that is a situation then, the price set by the government would help to uh, lower that which has been set by the market forces. Usually to benefit people who cannot be able to afford the commodity in the market. A good example, look at the education by the, the state-sponsored uh, students. As much as they, st as they study, for example, at our college, which is a private uh, institution, the tuition fee is determined by the government. We can't charge more than what the government has said. Reason, uh, as far as the public education is concerned, all that which is provided by the state, we have got so many people in our society who cannot afford the private tuition. And therefore, the government sees that whatever has been set by the market forces is too high. Let's regulate this by setting an affordable fee by most students in our country. Therefore, a maximum price control is a price set by the government, okay, on a certain commodity through which the uh, seller or the dealer of that product cannot sell it beyond that price as put in by the government. It occurs when the price that was set by the market forces by the fail by the government, it was too high, and therefore the government set a, a relatively a lower price so that majority can be able to afford the commodity. Another major scenario into which the government may go for the maximum price control is a case where the nation could be experiencing uh, something like inflation. Inflation, as we read around C, it's one of our topics to go by, is a situation in the country where the prices of goods and services are persistently increasing. They are actually too high. And so by the fail by the government, you may find majority are not able to uh, cope up with such high prices. Therefore, the government may regulate this price by setting a maximum price control. Such a way, majority can now be able to afford the commodity in the market. So to uh, do away with the high rate of inflation, one of the things that the government may consider to do in the nation is by setting a maximum price a control. So that is what we can call a maximum price control, also acting as a ceiling. Why as a ceiling is because we can't sell the product to which the government has set a maximum price beyond that price in the market for the commodity. 
So that is a major reason as to why we call it a ceiling in the market. Okay, number two is what we call a minimum price. And of course, as we talk of the maximum, before I go to the minimum, there are so many other circumstances that the government may feel we really need to go for the maximum price control. Like maybe we want to promote our productions in the, in the country where people would be uh, like discouraged from buying the important commodities. If let's say we go to a shop where we see the price has been set by the government as a relatively lower price and we can afford that which is being produced locally, of course we'll go for it and by so doing, we are supporting our local infant industries and we might realize growth and development in our industries through the maximum prices that the government may be setting for some commodities are in the market. Our number two uh, and the other circumstances again reaching to maximum price control uh, being a measure taken by the government in the country. Number two is what we call the minimum price control. And we can also call this one a price floor. And this is a situation where uh, you remember we had a price called the PE, which was set by the market forces. If the government feels that that price, which was set by the forces of demand and supply was too low, yeah, the government's intervention would be with the name of making that price to be a relatively high. I repeat, if the price set by the market forces of demand and supply is too is too low by the fail by the government then the price we are calling minimum price will be set with the name of making such a price to be relatively high therefore it is a price acting as a floor why because we cannot sell the product below that price Basically, this price will be aimed at helping uh, like those particular uh, producers whose prices are very low in the market for their products. The government may wish to support them. If your commodity is fetching a poor price to help have an increase in the price of such a commodity, the government may consider a minimum price control. Another good scenario is like what happens in our country, uh, Reba Day. One of the main uh, reasons as to why people attend uh, such a function as held by the government is actually to hear of a change on the minimum wage. We hear of a certain industry uh, that every other worker working in such uh, organization, the lowest pay should be 20,000. Of course, this is to help to boost the living standards by the people in the country that they are able to afford the goods and services. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the arguments why we go for a, a push on the pay is because of the cost of living being high in the country. So the government may uh, call for industries to pay their workers a certain minimum wage or salary upon which they can now be able to afford a number of their uh, wants in the society. And this is a charge already indicated by the government or a, an amount indicated by the government to which you shouldn't be paying your workers below that particular wage or if it's a price for the commodity, then we should not uh, 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 charge a lower price for that commodity. Of course, there are some implications in regards to each one of these uh, price controls. Uh, because when it comes to say you are a producer, for example, 
and you are forced to charge a lower price for your product. What are the implications, assuming you had already produced and the price uh, for the materials you are using, or in general, the cost of production was high, and that that price cannot meet that cost, what happens? There may be some who will not be able to survive in the industry in the name of a very low price for the product, not being able to realize the profits targeted, for example, by the uh, suppliers or the producers in the market. This may mean uh, quitting uh, the industry, for example. And of course, shortages are going to become chronic or they prevail in the market for the commodity in the name of uh, some moving out of their uh, business. Because if the price is not a guarantee for you to even cater for the cost, say you're incurring losses, if it is in the long run period, as we rate around C, uh, when we get to the production theory, because there's a period of time you cannot quit the industry. But if it's the long run, somebody may decide to walk away and maybe to try other uh, avenues where maybe prices are not controlled by the government. And the same happens to the minimum price controls. A good scenario is uh, through the wage, say, as indicated by the government, you cannot uh, keep on paying your workers as per the demands raised by the government. You may uh, resort into incurring huge cost of production through the uh, cost of labor. And by so doing, one may fail with the losses incurred. I cannot survive in this, so you may decide to again walk away. And in the name of that, we will suffer in the country because we'll realize some shortages, unemployment levels will be high, levels of uh, earnings being low would mean uh, uh, less in terms of investment. So there are some implications. As much as we said, there are some uh, goodies to account to the price controls. Also, we have some other negative results in relation to this. Based on this now, your exercise for today, which I'll update you on this, you'll actually give out the advantages and the disadvantages. In a nutshell, you are trying to look at the uh, effects brought in by what we call the maximum price controls, as well as the minimum price controls. You look at that during your free time. The opposite of price controls class is what we call price decontrols. What is a price decontrol? Also referred to in some books, you may find this discussed as under price liberalization. This is a situation where you see we had a price control for the commodity. There was an intervention such a way the price was no longer to be set and controlled by the market forces of demand and supply. And when the governments walk away now to leave the price free, to be determined by the market forces, we talk about a price decontrol. So price decontrol is a form of transition in which that price for a commodity which was set by the government and of course regulated by the government is now left free. To be liberal means to be free. It's left free to be regulated and also uh, to be set by the market forces of demand and supply. So we are going back to where we started this morning, the uh, concept of equilibrium pre commodity in the market where price was actually determined by the market forces uh, for both demand and also a supply. So when we are talking of a price decontrol, we are stating this, this is a form of transition into which the price of a commodity is set free to be regulated by the market forces of demand and supply. We are moving from a state where the government was controlling, was setting and controlling the price of a commodity, now to be set and controlled by the free forces of demand and supply.
my question and again your exercise for today what are the advantages and of course disadvantages of this concept of equilibrium or rather the market uh, uh, equilibrium concept what are the advantages and the disadvantages of what we can call the work of price mechanism where we are letting the price to be set and controlled by the free forces of demand and supply as you do your exercise uh, try to relate to what you did under the free market society where uh, there were no uh, government intervention as an assumption such as there was no uh, something like a price control and so prices for the different commodities in the market were to be regulated by the free forces of demand and supply so you evaluate that during your free time we stop there for today i can take a few questions if any in regards to today's presentation